Oh, is it on now? Can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. My name is Natasha Viteri, and I'm one of the two 1L deputy directors for the SACIA project. Um, again, thanks for spending your Thursday night with us. So as a lot of you in the room know, the Asakia Project provides free legal assistance to farmers and irrigators in the San Luis Valley. Tonight we're celebrating the completion of the Montes Ditch Project where lots of students spent, I think, a combined 875 hours doing work on the project over four years. So again, that's what we're celebrating tonight. And I'm here just to welcome uh, Professor Sarah Craycarf, who is an incredible and fearless leader. So I'll let her talk more about the project. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, and uh, Natasha was generous with her introduction. I um, have actually very happily become just a figurehead um, because I somehow have managed to get amazing students to do all the work for me. Um, so I just stand up and talk about the project, and they, they do all the work. Um, I recommend this as a strategy for um, aging faculty and law firm partners and the like. Um, so uh, so I, I do want to specifically thank um, Natasha and Gregor, who did um, almost all of the work to organize the event this evening. Um, also to Leo Fougere and Matt Nadell, who are the other two uh, deputy directors for the project. And um, it was actually Gregor who started this notion of a student deputy director. I always had like one person who stepped up and really helped me run the project. Gunnar Paulson, who's here, was my, um, he never got the title deputy director, but he played that role um, when he was a student too. And I just feel so fortunate that, you know, you start to do some work that turns into a multi-year project that serves hundreds of people. And, um, and without my students, um, there's just no possible way that I would be able to um, continue it, let alone do it at the level that, that we all do. Um, so first, um, I'm going to, uh, oh, I also want to thank Sean Labar, who's not here, who helps organize everything that has to do with the Getches Wilkinson Center. Um, and we couldn't do any events without him. Um, so first, before turning it over to the more important people on the program tonight, who are Charlie Jaquez um, and Gregor, who will talk about the work on the Montez Ditch and, and all the, wh what the heck were those students doing for all those hours down in San Luis? Um, I'm first just going to describe the project to you, the Asakia project to you in some more detail, as Natasha said, um, and then uh, so that you actually have earned your um, CLE ethics credit, uh, I'm going to talk about how and why working on this project is uh, fulfilling of uh, the supervising attorney's ethical obligations um, and also reinforces um, ethical practice in our soon-to-be attorneys, the students. Um, so that will be the order of my talk. Um, and I'll start with just a description of the Asakia project. Um, and I'm going to talk about the origins of the project, uh, the work we do in the community and the need for it, uh, and, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, after, and then the ethics component, and then turn it over to Gregor. Um, so first, just a little bit about, about the origins of the project. Uh, we started in 2012, um, and uh, it all started with a phone call from Peter Nichols, who's in the back of the room, and he's a Colorado law alum and also one of the preeminent water law attorneys in the state. Uh, and he said, hey, do you have a couple students who maybe could do a handbook on Colorado water law for some communities down in the San Luis Valley? And I was like, yeah, sure, I could find a couple students. And we, I think Peter and I thought this would take like a summer um, to draft a handbook for Asakias uh, and, you know, describe their water rights to them, and, and that would be that. Um, well, it turned out that drafting the handbook took, I think, two years. Uh, and um, at the same time, for reasons that will become clear, uh, we quickly realized well before the handbook was done that just drafting a handbook, while useful, was not actually going to give the assistance to farmers and irrigators in the valley that they needed. Um, and so that's the teaser, and I'll explain more about what, what we do and why we knew more was needed as I describe the project. Um, so as Natasha said, the gist of it is we, the law students, provide free legal services to farmers and irrigators in the San Luis Valley, um, and uh, we recruit pro bono attorneys to supervise them on their individual cases. Uh, it is very much a community-based project. 
Peter got the, the call for the handbook from the Sangre de Cristo Asequia Association, and we worked with them in Colorado Open Lands, uh, and uh, we continue to work very closely with our partners in the Valley, um, and we take direction from them every year about what kinds of cases uh, and community presentations are needed. Um, and here is just a list of some of the pro bono attorneys that we've worked with over the years, again, several of whom are here in this room. So probably that initial description raised as many questions as it answered for you, and that was on purpose. Um, so where is the San Luis Valley? I think most of you know, but not all of you. Um, in other words, where do we work? Um, well, the valley is in the south, southern part of the state, uh, very close to the border of New Mexico. Our clients predominantly are in Castilla County, um, which is the red dot on the map there. So you can see it's just right um, on the border with New Mexico. Uh, and uh, we work predominantly in Castilla County because that's where most of the state's acequias are. And don't worry, I'm about to tell you what an acequia is. That's the other <laughs> question that most are like, she said that a bunch of times, we still don't get it. Um, there are also acequias in Conejos, Huerfano, and Las Animas counties. And uh, we've done some work in Conejos County too, um, but uh, the center of gravity is here in Castilla County. Um, and the students and I spend a lot of time in San Luis, uh, which is in Castilla County, and it's the oldest town in Colorado. Uh, and hearing that begins to give you a sense of the broader history of the San Luis Valley and why we do, do the work we do. So um, how is it that the oldest town in the state is right down there near New Mexico? Um, well, the answer is because San Luis was a town before Colorado was a state. Um, it was a town before Colorado was a territory. Uh, and the first non-indigenous settlers to come into this region uh, were Spanish and Mexican settlers moving into what was then Mexico. Uh, and uh, they settled the region and started farming and irrigating according to their traditional principles uh, and also uh, distributed land according to um, the system predominant in Mexico under Spanish land grants. And then in 1848, there was the Mexican-American War, um, and the United States uh, obtained all of Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, um, and uh, California. And so the border moved over this community and San Luis, um, probably just kind of a, you know, average age town or whatever in the region, became the oldest town in Colorado when Colorado eventually became a state. And yet you still don't know what are acequias. Um, uh, so acequias are uh, the traditional irrigation uh, institutions, cultural and legal institutions, that those original Mexican and Spanish settlers used to farm in a high altitude desert, essentially. Um, the valley, like most of Colorado, gets very little rainfall. And so if you want to farm where there are on average less than 20 inches of rain a year, dry land farming as it was called, you need to irrigate. Uh, and so to irrigate, you divert water from gravity fed uh, rivers flowing down from the mountains um, and you divert those into your gravity fed main ditches or mother ditches as they're called in the Asakia community. And uh, then, and here's another image for you, um, then each individual landowner or family can divert their water off of that main or mother ditch um, so that they can irrigate their lands uh, during sometime during the spring runoff season, uh, which starts, you know, whenever the snow starts to melt in, um, in, in, our, in our region. And, and so this, you know, ancient way of irrigating when there isn't enough rain to fall on your crops uh, was initiated in the valley before, again, before the United States took that as part of their territory and country and continues to this day um, in those four counties that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so why, there's still more questions, right? Um, why do acequias need special legal help? So hopefully you have a little bit of an idea of what acequias are, um, where they come from, why they exist in particular in this part of the state, uh, and they're all over New Mexico, too, right? And, and when you're in this part of the state, you feel very much, I mean, geographically, culturally, it feels a lot more like northern New Mexico, I think, than it does 
like other parts of Colorado. Um, so why do acequias, whether on our side of the state border or the other, need specialized legal help? Um, well, the short answer is because the water law of acequias is in many ways in direct opposition to the core principles of Colorado state water law. Uh, so I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, one is that acequia ditches operate in general according to the following governance principles. Each family um, that is on a ditch and has rights to divert from that mother ditch uh, gets one vote in the governance of the acequia. So one landowner or one family, one vote is a core governance principle. Um, another core principle is that water is shared equitably in times of scarcity. Uh, in other words, after that big runoff, when the water starts to go low, and in some years, you know, there isn't a big runoff, like last year, for example, um, how, how, how do you share the water in the ditch? Does the first person in line get to take it all? Uh, does the oldest diverter, not an age, but the oldest water right get it all? Uh, no, under Asakia principles, water is shared in times of scarcity. The mayor domo, the ditch rider, uh, will go around to all the families and talk about this, like who needs what water and when, um, right? So water shared equitably in times of scarcity, as opposed to a core principle in Colorado water law, which is first in time, first in right. The oldest right gets to take their, their full allocated amount of water. Um, and then it descends in order, right? So that whoever's the most junior user uh, gets whatever's left in a, in a, in a low water year. Um, and uh, with regard to one family, one vote, likewise, irrigation ditches under traditional Colorado water law uh, vote according to shares of water owned. So, so far, two core principles of Sakias in direct opposition to Colorado water law. Um, finally, it's a, it's a custom tradition and also you could say law of Sakias that everyone participates in the maintenance of the ditch. Uh, in yearly ditch cleanings and also annually with, for whatever work needs to be done to ensure that the main ditch stays um, solid and clear and water can run, th run through those laterals without obstructions. And there's no similar requirement um, that everybody pitch in and help with a work requirement in uh, state law-based, um, traditional state law-based irrigation ditches. Uh, so there's a good setup here, right? Well, with that different a setup and structure, then traditional water law might not be able to help Asakias too much. Um, so why wasn't there a Asakia project, you know, in the year that Colorado became a state? Um, and the answer is because although Asakias uh, were recognized in early session laws, uh, they their law didn't become part of the Colorado uh, core legal system um, until 2009. Um, and yet, ASEQA has continued to operate, mostly kind of just coexisting, you could say, under the radar, um, governing in the way that they traditionally governed with people outside of places like Custia County not caring or knowing or paying much attention. Um, but after about 2000, and honestly, actually before, um, more and more people wanted to buy land in the valley. There have been different waves of real estate speculation in the valley. Most of them have ended in, in colorful and spectacular failure, um, which has been a good thing for the community uh, because then they can keep their land without prices skyrocketing and outsiders not understanding what an Asakia is. Uh, so, but in more recent times, those pressures have really come to bear. And uh, so uh, there were some prominent people from um, San Luis and, and the Valley generally who lobbied the legislature and they had some help from attorneys. And they managed to pass uh, two statutes, the first of which is the core one, the Asequia Recognition Statutes, that for the first time since early in the state's history gave official legal recognition and status to Asequias. Uh, so that they could uh, incorporate and become legal entities on a par with mutual irrigation ditches, and they could, above board, as a matter of positive law, um, have one land under one vote rules, um, have uh, shares, not shares of water dictating votes, but one, but um, and also be able to share water in, in times of scarcity. Um, and so the statute defined Asakias essentially to recognize the existing Asakias in those four counties. Um, they had to have originated before Colorado was a state. 
Uh, they have to treat water as a community resource and operate um, gravity-fed water systems and operate according also to the principles we've already discussed. Um, so it's, it's a really great law. It's pretty simple and short and, and codified existing practice, which is what, in theory, state water law in Colorado has always done. First in, right, first in time, first in right, originated in the mining camps and became our state law. Um, so it was really a nice thing, an incredible thing in some ways that uh, finally, in 2009, Asaki has got a similar approach um, from the legislature. Uh, but to benefit from the statute, to be able to assume powers that they had always used uh, and have them recognized under state law such that when newcomers come in, they're on notice uh, that they're part of Asakia, they may have to help either uh, clean the ditch or in the alternative pay dues, um, that water's shared, that they don't just get to say, you know, first in time, first in right. To benefit from that, Asaki has had to pass a written set of bylaws. And although Asaki has had a customary bylaws, a handful but not very many of the over 100 Asaki has had written bylaws. So this is where we came in. We thought we could just write a handbook and explain. Um, but it, again, it quickly became evident that what would be much more helpful would be if teams of students with a supervising attorney could go and work with Asaki as explain the recognition statute to them, uh, take their uh, oral testimony about how they've been operating that, translate that into written bylaws so they could take advantage of the unique powers under the Asakia recognition statute. Uh, and so we started that in the fall of 2012, spring of 2013, and we've been uh, doing that work with Asakias ever since. So now to the um, money part of the <laughs> presentation for those of you who are practicing attorneys. Um, what does this have to do with legal ethics? Um, well, working with student attorneys as supervising attorneys reinforces lawyers' ethical obligations um, in two ways. Uh, first, and this is what I'm gonna talk about on this slide, uh, it's a good refresher for you as a, a lawyer about your ethical obligations because Hopefully, you're enforce, reinforcing them with your students uh, as they are working on actual cases with live clients. And a lot of the student volunteers are first-year student attorneys, um, and so they're hearing about these ethical rules for the very first time. And we mention them in the trainings that we provide for students in the fall, uh, but like all people who practice any kind of law, they should just also become ingrained in your interactions with your client. So uh, Rule 1.1, for example, it requires us all to engage in competent representation. So how do we ensure that our student attorneys, first year students, can engage in competent representation? I don't know, so the pre presentation, no. So, <laughs> they, and they all do. Um, so we, one, we provide three free trainings for them in the fall on Colorado water law, the basics of, of water law, Colorado water law specifically, and then water law in the San Luis Valley. So we do free trainings to our students so they acquire the substantive knowledge they need to work on these bylaws cases, which are otherwise, as a legal matter, fairly simple. Um, but it's just a good reminder for our students and all practicing lawyers that there's learning on the job constantly, so you can, in fact, provide competent representation. Uh, and that uh, you, as a lawyer, have an ongoing obligation to train yourself, whether by reading cases and statutes and so forth, um, or attending CLEs such as this one, uh, so you acquire the substantive knowledge to become competent. Um, a second rule that is pervasive, I think, for the students is to learn about how to convey the scope of representation to clients um, and how to allocate authority on a case. So one of the very first things the students learn to do is to draft an engagement letter um, for the SACIA that they're working with um, to define the scope of representation. Uh, and for most law students, this is a unique experience. I think most law students don't see an engagement letter until after they graduate from law school. So they don't think that this is part of their obligation to their clients is to explain to them what I'm going to do for you and by implication what we can't do for you. And that's another way that scope of representation comes into play in our work. Uh, when we go down to the valley, it's always a wonderful experience for many reasons. It's a beautiful place. Um, and the community members have always been extremely generous and welcoming. Um, but there are lots and lots of legal needs. 
And so my students, and I have to tell them this, and I hope the other supervising attorneys do too, have to be very clear about what we can and cannot do. Uh, because you don't help anyone as a lawyer if you overpromise. Um, so scope of representation, very important as a lawyer and also as learning experience for student attorneys. Uh, rule 1.4, communication. Uh, I love this one because uh, if you know anything about um, compliance with, with the rules, it's one of the ones that trips up lawyers the most. Um, the, you know, the things people think about are stealing client funds and so forth, and fraud. But, um, but most complaints that come through are because my lawyer hasn't called me in weeks, you know. So we talk about this too, that even if nothing's going on in the case, um, there's an obligation to communicate with your, uh, with your Asakia. Check in with them every now and again. If you haven't heard from them in a while, um, send them an email, try to call. Uh, and the communication obligation is heightened in a community where until pretty recently, and Charlie can talk more about this, a lot of people didn't have mobile phones or the internet. Uh, and, and so we talked about how to engage in culturally appropriate communication with clients who live in very rural areas. Um, and then uh, confidentiality, again, it's the first time most students will have heard about this rule in a non-TV kind of setting. We talk about the importance of maintaining notes and case files. Um, and even if you hear something really exciting and gossipy from the community, which you often do, that you can't spread that around <laughs> um, because it may contain uh, confidential client communications. Uh, so. Those are just a few of the rules that are just integral to working with students in the San Luis Valley with the Asakia Project that I think reinforce both the supervising attorney's ethical knowledge and obligations and um, pass them on to the students. And then finally, you as the supervising attorneys, if you work with our project, help to fulfill your, fulfill your pro bono um, aspiration, I put in italics, because that's all it is under Colorado rules. We have no pro bono requirement under our professional rules. We just have a, a hope <laughs> that you should aspire um, to render at least 50 hours of pro bono public legal, legal services per year. Um, I don't know how many lawyers actually comply with that. Um, one. Two, I don't know of those that do how many actually do the highest priority pro bono representation that's identified in the rules, which is to provide a substantial majority of those hours without fee or expectation of fee to persons of limited means. In other words, pro bono legal services to low-income communities, um, that's the highest priority in this advisory ethics rule. But uh, my guess is that most lawyers who fulfill the 50 hours probably do it through other kinds of service, you know, service on boards or um, cause-related service, and all of that's really great. Um, but we know that in this state, in this country right now, the most serious need for pro bono legal services is for poor and low-income people and communities. Um, and so we provide a way for lawyers with specialized knowledge, water law knowledge, to engage in that highest priority of public service um, in ways that fit with their areas of expertise. And uh, we, we, we hear from our supervising attorneys how much they appreciate that and enjoy that. Um, we know that it means a lot to our students. I hope and like to think it means a great deal to our clients in the San Luis Valley too. Um, and maybe it's a decent model. Uh, I remember when I was just a regular old legal aid attorney, we had mixed feelings about <laughs> firm lawyers who wanted to do pro bono work because they weren't trained to do it. And my attitude then was just write me a check because <laughs> that's more helpful than teaching you how to do this case. But if we could arrange pro bono projects in ways that link up specialized attorneys with um, communities that need their work, uh, then, you know, you're capitalizing on things they already know and helping them fulfill their pro bono requirements. And I think um, maybe somewhat optimistically <laughs> um, helping them have more meaningful work lives as attorneys. Um, so that is it from me. Thank you very much. Um, and now you get to hear from the, the really exciting and fun people, um, including um, starting off with Charlie Hawkes, right? Charlie, you're going to go next. Yeah. So, uh,
It was too big of a personality. This, I can never, I can never. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, Charlie, we're so glad. Um, he's been working with our students for years now, and they have loved every minute of it. And this, by the way, was very typical of our organizational capacity. <laughs> we do a lot of stuff that's very well organized, and then we do some stuff on the fly. Um, so I want to welcome Charlie. Thank you so much Thank for coming you, up from I the Valley. Thank you. A big hug for all the work you've done so uh, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Charlie Hawkins. I, um, I'm a retired science and math teacher down in San Luis, oldest town in Colorado. I'll talk, talk about that a little bit. I'd like to introduce my wife, Kathy. She's wearing pink there. And uh, that's my honey. I mean, uh, I wouldn't be here without her. And uh, our son, David, he's a postgraduate student here in biology. And so, okay, so the Montes Ditch Project. Oh, everybody carries one of these around with them, I'm sure, in their pocket. So um, let, let's just um, let's move on here. So uh, uh, Montes Ditch, uh, Asequia. So the Asequia is just a Spanish word for ditch, you know. And uh, it comes from the old, old world, the old country. And it's Spanish, uh, more, uh, I don't know the whole history of that. But so anyway, the Montes Ditch was appropriated in 1853, August 31st, 1853. Has a priority of number four from the Rito Seco Creek with a flow of one cubic foot per second to irrigate 12 acres. So no big deal. But uh, the, the rate really uh, is uh, one cubic foot per second for to irrigate 80 acres. And so we got, uh, that's when the town of San Luis is made out of dirt. And so you could irrigate it with a ditch. Now it's, you know, it's very modern. It's got sidewalks and paved roads and some of the ditch just has to go on the ground because uh, progress. Uh, so San Luis, uh, Colorado, the oldest town. Uh, how do we know that? Because it says right there on the, on the hill. <laughs> that's when Colorado used to be uh, abbreviated C-O-L-O dot, period. Uh, that's a WPA project in the 1930s during the Depression. And uh, so it was established April 5th, 1851. Uh, there was 10 families that settled. And this slide comes from a presentation that I did at Hawkins Family Reunion. And there was Juan Ignacio Hawkins and Venancio Hawkins that were among the original settlers. So I say that because then we have a whole bunch of uh, pride about it. Uh, and and there's something to be proud of. It's also something probably to be ashamed of because um, this was Ute territory. This was Ute land. And uh, they never claimed it. And uh, Europeans claimed. You know, a European shows up, stick the flag in the ground, and they, I claim this in the name of the king. Uh, the Native Americans basically just lived. They lived, uh, they were part of nature. Uh, anyway, that's a cl clash of uh, cultures, and, uh, and we know, you know, they live in, in reservations, and we live in San Luis. Um, the, San Luis is part of the Sangre de Cristo land grant. So this was a land grant, and by the way, the grant comes down here. It's about 25% of it is in New Mexico. And it was granted by Mexico to Carlos Bovian, who was a French... Canadian that became naturalized Mexican citizen. He was a go-getter. He knew what he was doing. And uh, so he got himself a million acres and uh, settled in 1851, but he was also smart enough to patent it. He patented it by the United States Congress in 1871, so it did not get homesteaded. Uh, and so um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but the grant, the grant heirs, like me, we litigated for you know three decades to regain some certain settlement rights. And uh, the saying was, you have a snowball's chance in hell of winning this lawsuit. And it says there, we won. <laughs> uh, but going back to the Mexican War of 1846-48, the Mexican War, you go to Mexico and you talk about it, and they go, it's la invasión de los norteamericanos. That was the invasion by the North Americans. Uh, and so the Mexican War I, probably sounds better. But you could see uh, Mexico refused the annexation by the U.S. of Texas. So things got hot. I've been to the Alamo, and they said, gentlemen, remove your hats. And I wasn't a gentleman. And they came to me and remove your hat while you're in there. It's like a church. Uh, the doctrine of manifest destiny was, was uh, huge, going strong. Slavery issues. There's uh, people in government that were going, what if we can make all of Mexico and Central America slave states? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, so President Polk sent Zachary Taylor, General Zachary Taylor, 
into battle, and Mexico lost about 47% of its, of its territory. So we, we're right here in Boulder, and uh, San Luis is right here. This is the Arkansas River. From the Arkansas River south was Mexico until 1848. And uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is a treaty that, en that ended the war. It's like a book. And uh, um, it was signed February 2nd, 1848. The U.S. paid Mexico $15 million out of probably guilt money. I'm not exactly sure. It was to help pay for some debts and things like that. And there was other monies that were paid, like for the gas and purchase and things like that. But it's called the Treaty of peace, friendship, limits, and settlement between the United States of America and the Mexican Republic. And it has lofty language. In the name of Almighty God, a sincere desire to end the war which unhappily exists and to establish peace and friendship, assure harmony and mutual confidence, we should live as good neighbors. We haven't figured that one out yet. Aslan. Some of you may have heard of Aslan, others know. Aslan is the mythical origin of the Aztecs. And Aslan became part of the United States of America uh, after the treaty was signed. So the rights of Mexican citizens, who are now Americans, will be respected. And that's what our lawsuit in Rail versus Taylor, which I'll talk about a little bit later, was. Those rights were not respected. And a lot of them still aren't. And you know, we're real good at treaties. The United States of America should be the United States of America and treaties. Because we know how to make them. Uh, but we don't do a real good job of, you know, complying. Uh, well, and, and for example, right here, my, my ancestors were Mexican. They were Mexicans. They came up uh, from Mexico. Uh, uh, well, even the Hawkins gene, my, my gene, it comes from um, the, the Caucasus Mountains, Georgia, southern Russia. And that's where the mother gene it was first detected. It moved. Well, uh, it moved west to uh, the Mediterranean, and then from there, some to, uh, some to Europe, mostly to Mexico, and then up to the U.S., and, you know, here I am, and we had 250 Hawkes, uh relatives in San Luis a couple of years ago for a reunion. Uh, the son of all Mule in San Luis kind of uh, shows the, uh, what we would say is our legacy. There's this, this right here is actually a halo, and there's a woman there, and she's breastfeeding. And these are the original settlers. These are the Spaniards with the, those metal hats, helmets. Uh, Jesus Christ crucified. And up here it says PZ, Paz. And uh, here is the Native American, uh, uh, you know, beautiful pony, hauling grass away from these guys. Uh, here are the us, you know, and uh, irrigating. There's a shovel. This guy here, he's... Uh, branding a calf. This is Mother Earth. Mother Earth, and here's the water, and here is all the bounty. And these are, are us, you know, the, the cowboys, uh, vaqueros, and uh, he has his rifle, and he has a deer that, that uh, he went hunting. Uh, down there, uh, traditional hunting is a big deal, and you, some of you probably know uh, back in 1990 or so, we had a huge Paramil well, hell, it was military uh, uh, incursion in Costilla County, and they didn't even tell the sheriff because they knew that he would probably tell all his family and his friends that, you know, the Division of Wildlife is coming to get you. And uh, uh, we had a lot of, a, a lot of my friends in, uh, that were, some of them went to prison. Uh, one of them was a, a fellow teacher in the Quintanas, and uh, they woke him up in the middle of the morning, I mean, middle of the night, up against the wall, and, and uh, one of the Quintana smart asses, uh, how much is this fine going to cost us, do you think? And it was, and they said, it's going to be a lot of money. And they go like, it's going to take a lot of poaching to pay for that. Up against the wall, mother <laughs> leper. Uh, the stations across, uh, you had a very wonderful picture of that taken from a high, higher, higher elevation. And... Uh, you're welcome to come down and look at that. It's beautiful. Uh, we have the Stations of the Cross, which are life-size bronze sculptures by Huerto Mestas. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's, you can do it as a religious thing, as a spiritual thing, as an artistic thing. If you just want to run up and get in shape, uh, all, those things, all those things will come. Um, I'm a member of the Land Rights Council, and this is a grassroots movement that started in 1979. 
And so we sued for settlement rights to the Merced Sangre de Cristo, Sangre de Cristo land grant. And um, so what we sued for is that we had the right to go up there. Okay, you're a lawyer, so hell, use the big words. Uh, we sued for usufructory rights. And, uh, and so that means like, uh, you know, that's not an American term. I mean, that, that came way back from medieval uh, Europe where the little people had the right to go up uh, uh, into the forest and the Lord of the Manor owned the forest, but the little people could go and gather nuts and uh, herbs and firewood and, you know, whatever other kinds of things they, they would do. Well, so we, want, so we sued for um, hunting, fishing, recreation. Those were three, three of the rights. The other three were grazing, wood gathering, and timbering. And uh, we were just at the Colorado Court of Appeals just a few months ago, and they asked, uh, wood gathering? People go and gather wood? Those are the justices. And I was going like, yeah, people still do that. They still have wood-burning stoves, and uh, we have propane in our home, but it's very expensive, and there's a lot of people that can't afford it. And by the way, it's always a cu culture shock. I mean, I'm from Colorado, uh, but being a, a sun, you go to Sunwees, and it, you're dropping down third world. You know, uh, a, a, a city block here in Fort Collins probably worth about as much as Costilla County. You know, I mean, it's. Uh, but the bottom line is that we won in this case called Lovato versus Taylor. It took about 30 years, and if it hadn't been for pro bono attorneys, we never would have gotten it. You know, that cost a zillion dollars. And uh, we, uh, well, we have one, Jeff Goldstein, I'm not sure if he's associated with the University of Colorado Law School, but uh, he was on there for 25 years. And we gave him an award one time at, uh, oh, they had this big lawyer's dinner and banquet and stuff, and so we gave him a glass plaque for 25 years of, of service, but he had only done 24, so we said, you still owe us one. <laughs> uh, and I think you've already seen this. Uh, where is uh, uh, La Sierra? Well, it, this is about 80,000 acres now of uh, what is, we call La Sierra, the mountain. Uh, it's been called uh, the Taylor Ranch. It's, uh, now it's called Cielo Vista Ranch. Now it's CBR2 because it has a different uh, owner. And we're going to have a meeting, by the way, uh, Next week, we're going to have a meeting of community members with the owner and his lawyers, and, and we're actually, it, it, it's historic, I think, because we always spit at each other and hiss and stuff, and, uh, and now we're like going to cooperate, I hope, you know. And by the way, I remember one time we had, um, we had a meeting with uh, Zachary Taylor after Jack Taylor, the original owner. He was a bad guy. He hated Mexicans and niggers. I mean, he said that to the New Yorker magazine. And, um, but after he passed away, his son, Zachary Taylor, took over. And, uh, so we met with him, and uh, we met in almost 40 miles away. And uh, so we're meeting here. So we showed up there, the stakeholders from the community. And we wait and wait, he's not there. They go, oh, this is a decoy. He's actually gonna be over here at this other hotel, but for security reasons. So we went over there, and he did show up. He had the Colorado State Patrol, AR-15s and the whole thing. I mean, you thought it was World War III. And we sat across a huge table, and he wasn't a monster, and we were monsters, and we talked for a while, and then went and had lunch. So it was, you know, I mean, things can work out. Uh, so on the Sangre de Cristo land grant, uh, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled in favor. Of, well, we, this was a class action lawsuit on behalf of the heirs of the original settlers. So we won, but we didn't win as heirs. We won as successors in title. And so we have some people that uh, want to live off the grid, for example. We're getting a lot of them, especially now that Colorado's a cannabis state, CS. Uh, um, we get a lot of people that, gee, for that. But uh, they, they can get a key to the mountain because they have some land that was on Vala Strips, and I'll, I'll talk about those, and you showed a nice picture. Um, because the property they bought has those rights and they can get a key, open the gate and go up the mountain and they can get firewood or they can take their livestock and graze up there uh, or they can get timber. Not commercial timber, but you know, if you need to post or you're gonna make a corral or something like that, they can get that. And, and a lot of keys have been given out. It's a, it's a rough thing. There's a, a guy, I already forgot his name, but he wrote the book and it says the end of private, the death of private property, the end of private property or something like that. And um, 
So you own the mountain. But all these people can come up on it. That whole use your front street thing is, you know, it's, it's un-American, by golly. But that's what we have. Uh, bottle strips. So a bada is about a yard, 33 inches. And bottle strips is the way that uh, Mexican government used to deed land, uh, especially to settlers. Uh, they've also been called long lots. This lot here could go two miles. It could go 10 miles. It depended on where it, it was situated. But the important thing is all bottle strips intercept uh, a stream. In this case, usually they're perpendicular to the stream, more or less. So uh, there's property for, for a house, uh, for a yard, for a garden, for pasture, uh, for a, a ditch and a sequia, for the river and for a road. Uh, and it's an eminently fair system, eminently fair. Nobody there is going to ever get rich, because what can you do with, you know, with a 50 or 100 varas? You can't put a, a circle on it, that's for damn sure. And the people, we still live down there that way. There are no rich farmers. The farmers there are subsistence farmers. Uh, you make enough to live. Uh, so, eminently fair. Uh, I have, you know, I, have, I could talk more about it, but I won't. So if you look at it from a uh, uh, satellite, and so there are the strips. You can see them going this way. The, the creek, Culebra Creek comes down this way, goes around through there, through the narrows over here, and it used to head off to the Rio Grande. It does, it's over-appropriated, it doesn't make it there anymore, so we're not part of the Rio Grande Compact. But you can see the bottom strips, they come this way. Now, cross the county line, go to Conejos County. Now we are in America. <laughs> That's where you have sections and quarters and uh, however else you do that. Um, people down there do have a, 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 we have a strange, uh, I don't know about strange, but we have, uh, we see the mountains as sacred. They're sacred to us. I think maybe it's part of our Native American ancestry. Uh, the DNA tests show that we do, that that community is, has fairly high percentage of uh, Native American uh, ancestry. Uh, this, the dove, the bird, the eagle, right up here. This is a Culebra Peak, which is the 14er that comes out in the papers. Uh, the, this uh, snowfield right here is uh, kind of like a, a feature. Some people call it an eagle, and from the eagle, the water there collects into Culebra Creek. Culebra means snake, and so the Mexican symbol, there's the eagle, has got the snake, and all that kind of thing. Uh, Sangre de Cristo, blood of Christ. There you are, red. Uh, we also have like our celebration. So our big celebration is Santana. It's on July 26th. We have flags and sirens and all kinds of stuff. And we have horses and ambulances, fire trucks, occasional, occasionally a float. Uh, politicians, uh, they're... Uh, they, they show up for, the, for that, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they do. And, they, and then we have people throwing candy to the children and all that, and it comes complete with Queen uh, as well. By the way, the Queen here, uh, Angela, huh, Angela. Angela is not a deputy. Well, she, she's, I think she's in the Army Reserve, and uh, she became deputy sheriff. And not too long ago, they sent her out on, to, out into the hinterlands that there was two belligerent guys. They sent her alone. And she's this little queen. And uh, one guy attacked her, and the other guy watched. And uh, she kicked his ass and cuffed him, and, and cuffed the other guy too, you know. So, <laughs> you know, uh, don't mess with that queen. Uh, this is true throughout the world. Land and water are important. Uh, we say, sin tierra no hay paz. Without land, there's no peace. Sin agua no hay vida, without water there's no life. And, by the way, our water comes from here. Well, it comes from the clouds. And uh, I hadn't thought about saying this in the presentation, but you know, we have a reservoir that supposedly has a lot of mercury in the fish. That's mercury. Um, how do they say that when they, don't want, they want to give away the ending of, the, of, uh, of a show? Uh, Spoiler alert, <laughs> pretty much all the reservoirs and lakes in Colorado have mercury. And the reason is it's coming from 
New Mexico, Arizona from those coal, coal powered uh, 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 electrical plants. And the coal puts mercury into the air. It comes down as rain. It comes down to the, with rain and snow. And then it comes into the reservoirs and it concentrates and concentrates. The little bugs eat the mercury. The big bugs eat the little bugs, and then the, the little fish eat the, the bugs, and then the big fish eat the little fish, and blah, blah, and then we eat the big fish, and that's where you get, get your mercury. Uh, we used to have signs up there, and, and uh, some of those, um, Sanchez Reservoir is a uh, special place that people get big fish. Uh, and and it's, it warned about, about mercury. Those signs were torn down in 10 minutes after they were up, probably. Culebra Creek. So Culebra Creek runs through the Vega. The Vega is a, about 600-acre commons. So if you live there in that, in that community, you can take your cows and put them on the Vega for free. San Luis is right here. Uh, the Vega commons is, is a pasture, and it's essentially this area out in this direction. Uh, Culebra Peak, um, this was just, what, last week, I think I took that picture doesn't usually have that much snow. It looks, it looks great. I go, I gotta take this picture, man. Looks like it's solid snow. Uh, but no, the rocks show pretty quick. You know, uh, we don't get that much snow. By the way, the San Luis Valley averages about 10 inches of rain per year. So we're an amp alpine, uh, uh, desert. And so, uh, Culebra Creek comes down from here. This is, and other creeks come, uh, in this direction as well. And then the Rito Seco, comes from Trinchera Peak, which is a 13 and 13, 3, uh, 546. And that water comes down from here and goes around this way and then into San Luis. Um, a straight line diagram. Now, I don't expect you to read this, but I just want to show you that in the straight line diagram, the Culebra Creek is the main, is the main artery and it flows into the Rio Grande. It used to. It doesn't anymore. And all these others, the Ventero Creek, the Cuates, the Vallejos, uh, all those Event, they're tributary to the, to the Culebra Creek. Oh, and the Winter's Ditch would be up here on the Rito Seco part right there. They, they didn't put it on this, on this uh, diagram. Maybe if somebody wants to work with me, we can file a big lawsuit to fix that. <laughs> um, so in the Southern Costilla County, there are some big power actors. One of them was Battle Mountain Gold. They were since bought out by Newmont. They were there in the 90s. They got zillions of dollars of gold. They contaminated the crap out of the Rito Seco. Um, they were finally uh, shut down by the, okay, finally shut down by the uh, Colorado, uh, what is it, State Health Department and the EPA. They, those guys finally got together. But by then they had done their, their damage. And uh, there's a contaminant plume that is heading down towards, uh, down towards San Luis. So here's San Luis. And that contaminant plume is heading downstream. And if, if there were Superfund monies, that would probably be a Superfund site. But there is no Superfund money. Here is the, the La Sierra, the Cielo Vista uh, Ranch right now. It, all, they basically own, they, they own everything. The, 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 of course, the state owns like the wildlife on paper. They own the wildlife, and they can chase it to wherever they want, and they do things like that. And there are issues like that. There are issues. Uh, one of the issues we have here is that is drought. And uh, right over here across, across the mountain, we drove through there this morning. It's burned. I mean, this, there's like toothpicks all over the ground where the trees burned and then fell down. And this one is probably going to catch on fire as well. You were there at the Congreso, and there's experts that said it's not a matter of if, but when that catches fire, and when it does, we're not going to turn it off because we don't have the resources, and your roads aren't worth a damn anyway, and, and there are no structures. Uh, so um, those are uh, some of the issues. And with regard to water, some of the other issues that have our babies now are the cannabis uh, thing. You know, the cannabis thing is... We're getting a lot of people from all over the place, and they don't know what they're doing. And um, it, it causes a lot of problems for our county. So Rito Seco uh, Creek starts right there at the park, and it comes down to San Luis, and it runs into the People's Ditch. 
so the Montes Ditch, this acequia is the ditch that runs through town. And as I said, in 1853, that's when the town was made out of dirt, and so they could irrigate their orchards, their gardens. Uh, they didn't have lawns. Uh, and their, and their, uh, their stock. Uh, here, here's a partial flume that was put, by, put up by Battle Mountain Gold. It has a, has a solar panel up here, and, and I ask them if we can have data, and they go, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll work on it which we're never gonna get. But um, they're keeping track, these people are smart. They're keeping track of how much water they're losing. And this is an issue um, that the Buntas Ditch is dealing with because nobody does anything about it, but Belmont keeps the water. It comes down year round and they just keep it. Nobody, nobody squawks about it. And then if we get our little amount that comes down when we need it, and then, you know. Because there's only two places that it can go. It can go through town or it can go through the Vega, and most of the time, it goes through neither. So that means it's going to Battle Mountains Reservoir. So here's the Montes Ditch uh, head gate. Right, here's our head gate. Uh, there's a culvert that goes right here, and the ditch, the Montes Ditch, is along here. This is the Rito Seco. This is the actual creek. So we had John Cerna came and he burned it last week, and um, and that's what people over there do. You, you, you burn the you burn the ditch so that it has, you know, so that it, it can flow uh, without with very little resistance. And this is my, my late mom's property. And so the water comes from up there uh, and it comes through the ditch and right here there's a culvert and it goes underground. And it goes underground for about a fourth of, the, of its distance, something like that. Um, uh, we have a big problem with willows and so this property here belongs to the, to the Borellas, the uh, Mary, Mary Gold Borella family. And so they hired Jesse Alagón to come and cut the willows. So he cut the wheels. I mean, he worked. He cut the wheels. You should see them now. I mean, they are gorgeous. They are tall, and it's like if he had given them fertilizer. <laughs> and then the tail waters. This is the end of the Montes Ditch. And we forgot to do this, but Marcela Pacheco, who is um, at the end of the Montes Ditch, it never occurred to me, it never occurred to anybody that we should have done the title search on her property as well. We just, you know, just forgot. I apologize to her and, you know, I mean, she has clear title. I mean, they, they know what they're doing, but, uh, you know. Now, here's for the big boys. This is the Vallejo's Ditch. This is a water structure. And this is the Acequia Madre. This is the, the, the mother ditch, I think, called it. And so they have these wheels and you can turn them and it raises and lowers the floodgates and the water could go off to the left or it could go off to the right. And then there's what I call the less sophisticated method, which is us. And we have our little sorry ass uh, water structure here <laughs> and we plug it with some boards and we, we uh, take that little cover off and the culvert, the water rises and, and it goes through the ditch. Okay, so that's how we do it. Now the Cerro Ditch, another issue I think. Now they, uh, they, they're a big ditch. So the Sequia Madre is coming right through here. And they're using pipe, 24 inch pipe and 36 inch pipe, and they're coming underground. They come from way out there. It's way down here, you can't even see the pipe. So they're not gonna lose water, but I think they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna kill all, all that riparian area there that, I don't know, I, I have my opinions about that. Uh, the San Luis People's Ditch, uh, which is uh, appropriate uh, 21 or adjudicated 21 cubic feet per second. This is the number one uh, priority ditch in the state of Colorado. It was hand dug by the, by the settlers and it says so right here on this monument. It says, uh, this tablet is the property of the state of Colorado uh, commemorating the San Luis People's Ditch. The oldest Continuously used ditch in Colorado, I guess the oldest monument too, because I can hardly read it, uh, with uh, uh, court decree priority number one dating from April 10th, 1852, dug by the, uh, by the, the original settlers of Colorado. And then it says down here, Colorado's uh, greatness is built uh, upon irrigation. I don't know if it is or not, but uh, hey, it says so on the tablet. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and Greg said, make sure you say a lot of good things about the students. I mean, you know, 
So uh, I thought I'd put down some text instead of pictures, you know, because lawyers like all that. I was going to do some boilerplate language, and then I thought, no, that, it'll be too hard to read. <laughs> so working with the law students, uh, I put, I, first I put absolute joy. And it, it was it's true, right, Kathy? I mean, they'd come to our house, and, you know, we had, it was fun. You know, they're, they're, they're good people, uh, excellent role models. Uh, they they committed, cooperative. I mean, they they're doing this on their own. I mean, I call that a tonto, you know, a dummy. Because you go and you do things, which is what I do. That's the way I run my life. I do all things for free and then complain about it. <laughs> well, then stop doing it. Uh, we made a lot of new friends, and, you know, we had meals, and we talked about, uh, about uh, uh, San Medina's restaurant and the Mexican food. Uh, they were introduced to this, this rural experience, and... Uh, we did like tours of the area, the use of old technology, old technology. Uh, I, I do have a cell phone, it's an iPhone, okay? <laughs> but it doesn't work in Sao Paulo. I mean, it has one dot. If I'm lucky, sometimes when I move around the house, we go by a certain door, I might get two dots, and, and Gre Gregor, are you there? Gregor, Gregor, uh, Charlie, yeah, Gregor, you know. Uh, that's, you know, you live in God's country, as they say, you know, and that's part of the... That's part of the dues. Uh, we did a lot of conference calls. I, I thought that was really, uh, um, let's see, what was his name? Uh, Haupt? What was his first name? Barry? Will, Will Haupt. I knew Barry Haupt. So Will Haupt, he tried to set it up so that we could do the whole thing on the computer where you can look at each other and everything. And uh, we had about that much bandwidth. I mean, it just didn't work at all. So, uh, so we went, we stuck with the conference calls, which worked pretty nice. And we walked the ditch. And I think people introduced to the farm culture, which uh, that's what that is down there. Okay. Uh, here's the entrance to the dungeon at, uh, where they worked. These heavy doors. In the old courthouse, because I, I worked down there doing, I, genealogy is one of my hobbies. So I'd be down there digging through the books. And, and um, then I'd look and I'd go like, oh, geez, it's already after, it's past noon. I got the door was locked, man. I was locked in the dungeon. I guess they forgot me, or I don't know. So at 1 o'clock or so, they came in the open, and, you know, there was plenty of air, plenty of oxygen, you know, <laughs> so no problem. Uh, but they spent a lot of time. They spent a lot of time in here. And uh, these are the, the Libros Pesados, the heavy books. Those books are heavy. I mean, it's probably 20, 25 pounds. And um, some of them are in pretty bad shape. They're, like, literally falling apart. Some of them are written in Spanish. And... Um, and that's what I meant by old technology. I mean, these guys dug dug through it. They waded through this stuff, and I'm uh, and I'd ask them, do, "Do you like? Do you think you're wasting your time doing this?" You know, I mean, they go like, "No, this is this is a good experience." I go, "Okay, thank you, thank you very much." Uh, so the title research product uh, here is their their main product. This is a 400 400 page uh, book that they, book that they put together. An opinion of the water rights of the Montes Ditch, main branch properties with supporting documentation prepared by the Aseca Assistance Project. And um, uh, they did about 20 properties. And uh, starting up here, this is my mom's property. And it's yellow, uh, which uh, means that uh, it's not completely clear that the entire property has water rights. But my mom's property even says on the deed has water rights, a pertinent water rights. However, there was some land transfer and stuff in the eastern part of the yard. It doesn't say that that part has water, and so you'd have to do like a quiet title on that. Most of them are green. They, have, they do have their water rights on the Montes Ditch, except for Joseph Lovato over here. And that's, I think that's the only case that we found where water rights had been removed from the ditch. And those were removed back in the 90s, probably. And we had our local millionaire, uh, Junior Zigab. As well as Zikab Jr. And uh, he was quite the character. And, uh, and uh, may he rest in peace. But, uh, you know, we used to have a candy store. And, and we, sometimes we'd go, we had the best candy store in the whole town. But sometimes we'd go to Junior Zikab's. And he'd go like, how much money do you have? Dime? Okay. <laughs> he'd give you your candy. He, he didn't even get to pick the candy, you know? <laughs> oh, can I have a bag? Do you have a penny more? I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. So when he sold his property to these people from Chicago, um, Jennifer Powell and her husband, he reserved the rights, the water rights, surface water rights, water rights on the Montes Ditch, and the mineral rights 
uh, unto himself and his estate. I don't know why, how much is that worth? But uh, that property doesn't have those water rights. And I, I don't know how well I will fix that. Okay, so benefits to the ASEC, yes. And the, the, I'm talking about mostly the Montes Ditch because that's what I am, I know about. But, um, but it has benefited the ASEC that you guys have worked with. And one of them was bylaws development. That's what we started. We started Julia Gorino, and she's not here any longer, right? Okay. Uh, and so we developed our bylaws, and we adopted them. And then we went and we got, we had got assistance so that we could incorporate, and so we incorporated. The title research report, it, at a going rate, it'd probably be in the range of 100 grand, you know, for that report. I mean, it's, we could never afford that. We gained a lot of administrative tools about how to run our organization and uh, uh, defense against water grabs. Water grabs are the big thing, the big fear over there. The big fear is that we're going to lose our water because somebody with a lot of money is just going to come and grab them, buy them, and that's the end of it. Well, we know that we can defend against that now. Um, but the water grab is, is for real. There are people out there that uh, that's their intention. Uh, and also the educating ourselves about the uh, water law complexities. They, that it's, it is complicated. Uh, okay, so this says Hawkins Garden. But my grandpa, Lutero Esquivel, used to live only a couple of blocks, a couple of fences away from where we live in San Pablo. San Pablo is the suburbs of San Luis, okay? We live five miles away. And there's like 20 people that live in San Pablo, probably. Uh, so my grandpa lived there, and he was a subsistence farmer rancher. And we had great fun. Oh, it was just the most fun. He had the calves and pigs and, and uh, sheep, not sheep. Uh, the Huckers did have sheep, uh, my ancestors. That's my phone, I forgot to turn it off, I apologize. <laughs> But uh, so we'd be irrigating in the mud, you know, in the summer with uh, uh, kerosene lanterns and that kind of thing. It was just great fun. As I grew older, it wasn't so much fun. It was a lot of hard work, so I became a teacher. <laughs> and uh, I'm a gardener. Okay, I'm a gardener. There's a lot of drama in this whole uh, Sekia thing. It's a wonder that people don't kill each other. I mean, because it is governed not by, well, I mean, now we have the rules and the bylaws and the whole thing. Uh, but, I mean, it's like, well, it's a wonder people don't kill each other. I mean, ditch riders have a tough job. Uh, Kathy woke me up one morning. She says, look at our sunrise. There's this uh, Kalela Peak right there. And it was, it was gorgeous. And so, uh, Elfine, this is the end. Thank you for your generous help. We appreciate it. Uh, adios. And uh, really, I do mean it. We, we really do appreciate the wonderful help that you have given us. And good night. Yeah. Charlie's definitely a, a hard act to follow. Uh, in the best of circumstances. So two apologies off the bat. Uh, first, I am most certainly the least attractive speaker of the evening. And second, uh, this part of the presentation is probably about 80% dad jokes, so just be ready. Um, as one out coming onto the project, uh, like Professor Krakow said, Gunnar Paulson, who's here, uh, was running things. He was the man in charge. And when it came time to finally get our assignments, I uh, said, you know, he and Jesse Heibel said, you know, we've got this project and these three L's are going out and it just needs a little more research to finish. And, uh, well, I raised my hand uh, along with Genevieve Geiger right there and LJ, who's also here in the back. And uh, little did we know that little bit of research would turn into a whole lot of research, which is why my section is called Reflections on the Montez or What Have I Gotten Myself Into, uh, which I asked myself, Many, many, many times they're uh, locked in the dungeon, just like Charlie said. So a little bit about the case, you know, 22 properties, surface water, spring water, land, gold mines, culverts, complicated questions of law, really dry books. I mean, oh, your hands would crack at the end of the day. You had to bring lotion with you. It, ridiculous. And perhaps the best part, uh, huevos rancheros at Sam's Covered Wagon for lunch. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd put in a good five hours of, you know, reading these, these heavy books, and it was, it meant the world to me to 
both see the sunlight and eat some amazing food. So a, a case of this magnitude, what do you need? You need the dream team. And you know, thankfully for the Montez Ditch, thankfully for all of us, the Asakia Project is a dream team of dream teams. So in total, over the four years, two attorneys, one paralegal, nine students, all of us bringing sharp pencils and sharp minds to the table. I mean, you know, the, the cream of the crop here. Here, uh, unfortunately, all of our professionals are on the Western Slope. They have billable hours they have to meet, so a Thursday night's not the best. But Ryan Jarvis, Rebecca Mahler, and Kelsey Nichols, I mean, they stuck through it. Three sets of students they had to train over and over again. Four years of work. And even though they couldn't make it here tonight, they are going to make uh, time to watch the recording later. So if we could just give them a round of applause so they hear it on the backside. Yeah. I mean, think about it. They had to put up with me for three years. All right, and then here we got the dream team of 2017, Andrew Ball, Will Hopman, and Mariah Johnson. They, they really laid the groundwork. They figured out what the question was before we could even find the answer. And as you can see from these amazing professional headshots, they're, they're out in the world. They're doing great things. And I like to think that, you know, that's at least a scotch in part due to the, the training and the work and the practice that they did here at the Asakia Project. All right, now a little less serious, we're three L's. You got the, the crops cream of 2019 here, Genevieve Geiger, LJ Kuhlman, and myself. And, um, you know, coming into a project that's already ongoing can be really tough, especially when you think it's going to be really easy, and it's not. Um, so, you know, we kind of kept things moving along. We kind of retooled a little bit, and really what we did is we lined it up for the, uh, the work of plenties of 2020, Brianna Champ, Louis, Leah Fugeri, and uh, Charles Goodson, who really, you know, put in the hours when I took a page from Gunner's uh, playbook and I said, all right, 1Ls, uh, I got this case. We're really close to wrapping it up. We could just use a couple extra hands to push it over the edge and, uh, and we'll be done real soon. And, uh, you know, thankfully, Bree, Leah, and Chuck, raise their hands just like I did, and before they knew it, they were eating at Sam's Covered Wagon with big smiles on their faces. So, back, back to the money. Ethics. You know, as, as the supervising attorney, you've just gotten your three students, your students number four through six, your students number seven through nine. What do you do? You've got them. you got to assess, assess, assess. So, Rule 1.1, like Professor Krakow said, here at the project, you know, you're getting students who've completed their fall semester 1L classes. Hmm. They're getting Water Law 101, Colorado Water Law, and information on the San Luis Valley from some of our very excellent uh, pro bono attorneys who come in and give these trainings. They've been given a, a brief introduction to ethics by Professor Krakow, and then they receive our wonderful handbook, which some of you have seen, and we'll bring upstairs so you can flip through it and, ooh, ah, title search, we love it. And then beyond, beyond competence, um, in, in that sense of training and knowledge, experience. Every student brings something different to the table. Everyone's experience brings something different to the table that um, you, know, you can leverage to be successful. Um, and me being myself, I will talk about myself. So my knowledge coming in, other than those foundations, uh, really came from my Uncle Frank. That's Frank Molinsky on the left. He was the president of the Catlin Canal. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of water talk growing up. I knew what a headgate was. But in terms of lawyering, uh, pretty much what I knew was what is on this typed list of uh, definitions that they had. There you'll see uh, transferable water, consumptive use without injury. Yes, uh, water lawyers. Uh, expensive. But <laughs> unfortunately for any water engineers here, you know, you cost damn near as much as the lawyer, so that's not great. Um, but this, this is what I had coming in. So at least I, I had a passing familiarity with the fees I may one day uh, get for doing this kind of work. My other professional experience uh, was in the Army before coming to law school. Here I am with uh, my first commander, David Rizal, who commanded me here at the University of Colorado in the ROTC detachment, and then we actually served together in Korea. And it was officers like him who taught me that officers find and solve problems. 
That's what you do. And when you're in the Army, oh boy, you can find problems, but you have the authority and the scope to solve them. So you have these different previous professional experiences between your students leading to different expectations. And I came in with, I find and solve problems, which would get me in trouble later, but first we'll discuss why. Rule 1.3, diligence. This was probably the only rule I'd actually read before uh, taking ethics. I'm not sure how that happened. But, you know, a lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. But really it was the comment that got me, the first comment. A lawyer should pursue a matter on behalf of a client despite opposition, obstruction, or personal inconvenience to the lawyer and take whatever lawful and ethical measures are required to vindicate a client's cause or endeavor. I mean, right of the Valkyries, am I right? Wagner here in the, in the rules of ethics, my lord. Um, so I got this assignment. Man, I love research. I love solving problems. Let's make this happen. So my first trip down to San Luis, I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. This is great. I went to the dungeon. I was like, hmm, this isn't as beautiful or as great anymore. And that first day I'm down there uh, drying my hands out, Charlie comes in. And here's Charlie. And he looks at me. He's like, oh, are you, are you the student who came down? I was like, oh, yeah, Charlie. You must be Charlie Gray. And he took me to Sam's Covered Wagon, where I ate huevos rancheros. And he said, OK, here's some, here's some title documents. Here's a map. Here's this. Here's that. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is good. This is good. And then he said, oh, I've got, a, uh, I've got this piece of paper with 10 questions on it. And I looked at those questions, and a couple of them were title related. And about eight of them weren't. And I was so excited. Here I am thinking to myself, I am such a good lawyer already. I come down to answer one question, and I find these eight other problems I can solve. This is amazing. And uh, you know what I didn't know at the time was, well, what Charlie knew about me, Charlie knew I was a captain in the Army. But what I didn't know about Charlie is he was an officer in the Army in the Vietnam War. So he had really pegged me with this one. He knew if he gave me these questions, oh, man, I tell you, it was, you know, questions about culverts. I, I went out and bought a shovel. You know, questions about the San Luis uh, you know, mayor. I was like, all right, I'm going to the next city meeting. You know, we need money. I'm writing grants. There's a, there's a gold mine. Oh, man, this is, this is fantastic. So, uh, you know, taking my previous professional experience and, uh, well, what do we do? We go on patrol. Uh, I climbed a mountain. I found that gold mine. I took a picture of it. I was like, well, yep, there's the gold mine. There's some water. File that one away. And then, uh, well, questions about what, you know, why doesn't the water always get down to town? All right, we're gonna, we're gonna walk the, uh, the Rito Seco all the way to the headwaters. And you know what we found at the headwaters? A water thief! We found him! I took his picture! <laughs> we had words with the sheriff! Man, I love being a lawyer! This is so exciting! Water rights, water thieves, sheriffs! Here's my compatriot Bree with just the most disappointed look on her face. Shame on you, water thief. I mean, man, I am so diligent. I am a 1L, and I am just, oh, I'm taking off. Um, those of you familiar with the rules uh, think you might see a, a problem coming up with this. Oh, 1.2, scope of representation. Um, so the, the project, much like many law firms, uh, has an engagement layer with the client, and that lays out the scope of the representation. And when I went back and I looked at that letter, the line that was missing was, and the ASACU project shall apprehend or document all water thieves interfering with the ASACU's right to divert the natural streams of the state of Colorado and putting them to beneficial use. Uh, I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, and that was because I was the second wave. We came on years after the engagement letter had been written. Uh, so this was a good first, uh, you know, first real learning teaching point with me with our supervising attorneys as we're on that uh, conference call. When we get back and I'm like, I checked out that gold mine. I caught a water thief. We did this. We got all these questions. I want to answer them. Uh, you know, we spent 875 hours on the project as is. I, I think I probably had somewhat committed myself to about 8,000 more hours talking to Charlie there and Sam's. But luckily, Kelsey Nichols, she stepped me back. You know, she walked me away from the ledge. And uh, I learned something valuable. And that was, you know, 
it's diligence, but within the scope of representation. It, it took us a whole lot of work to get through those 22 properties and didn't involve handcuffs, didn't involve tasers, um, and it spent you know, a lot of time in the dungeon. But really, before I, before I hand it over to Leah, who's far better looking and more intelligent and funny, um, you know, as a 3L about to go out into the wide world of lawyering, this, this project has taught me not just water law, not just how to kind of function out in the world, but, you know, the ethics, yes, but really how to be a professional in a new professional setting. So just before I turn it over, I just want to thank you, Professor Krakoff, Charlie, thanks for putting up with me, and everyone else. Also, thank you for putting up with me. And now, Leah Fougere. Thank you. OK. Hi, everyone. I will be brief. Um, but talking a little bit about working in the Valley and the challenges um, kind of inheriting this problem came with, um, or in inheriting this opportunity, so I can think about it. Um, so I actually also returned to Rule 1.3 and the diligence um, side of things, but a different part of the comment actually caught my eye, which um, was perhaps no professional shortcoming is more widely resented than procrastination. Um, and that's a particular issue with this project. Um, it's very decentralized, uh, and so one once we receive our assignments at the beginning of the year, we're all excited. We've just gone through training. Uh, we receive our projects, and then it just becomes our own um, with our supervising attorneys. And so as student deputy directors, we help kind of shepherd that um, but with a very hands-off approach. And so the, uh, the evils of procrastination um, and letting things slip by you um, really come into play in this, in this type of project. So I think that... Um, working with professional attorneys who were uh, willing and able and eager to help us push us through that process, um, who were available to answer questions with us. We had um, periodic Skype calls, Google Hangouts with our attorneys to make sure that we were on track. Those were all really important in making sure that we didn't fall or, or succumb to some of the challenges that you can have in these uh, student-generated um, projects. And then also part four of the comment, which is that a lawyer should carry through to conclusion all matters undertaken for a client. And this one especially speaks to me because uh, Bree and Charlie and I were the last generation of students to take this on uh, over four years. And so to see this moment um, pass, to see that thick booklet being handed to Charlie um, was really something that I felt like we could check the box. And I didn't have to, as Gregor um, did, sort of walk into the project not knowing if the end was even in sight. Um, so even though there was a lot of work to be accomplished by the time that I came onto the project, uh, it was eminently doable in large part because of Gregor, because of Bree and Charlie and other Charlie um, in getting this accomplished. Uh, so it also pointed out Rule 1.4, which is communication. And this, as, as has already been articulated, is a particular challenge in the Valley to maintain consistent and reliable communication with clients. Um, we're a 4.5-hour drive or so um, to San Luis, um, which makes it really a challenge if you just have to get down there to do the work. Um, what's not been mentioned is that for many counties, a lot of these records have been digitized, and so you can look them up online. That, the same is not the case with Castilla County. Um, and so you actually have to go to what we've been calling the dungeon, which is a small windowless room in the cinder block establishment of the clerk and recorder's office, where you have to look up these records by hand. Um, and so thus the drying of the hands, which I can attest is entirely true. Uh, and so when you're thinking about undertaking a project like this that has challenges, especially in rural areas, um, it's important to think about the, the means and the really your methodology for approaching client communication. And so how are you going to reasonably consult with the client about the means by which the client's objectives are to be accomplished? Is this going to be feasible for us going forward? Um, and also, how are we going to keep our clients reasonably informed about the status of the matter? And Charlie is an, a really easy person to get in contact with, but acequias are made up of a lot of different people, and that can present a lot of challenges as well. Um, and so some acequias may be a handful of members, and some acequias are dozens, over 80, 90, maybe even 100 parciantes. So it's very difficult to keep a client reasonably informed, and that was something that we had to be strategic about going forward um, in all of these projects, but also in the Montez Ditch. Um, and so 
I'm also pointing out Rule 5.3, which is for regarding non-lawyer assistance. So if you're a lawyer thinking about taking on student uh, assistance or mentoring students, a lawyer who's doing that should give appropriate instruction and supervision concerning the ethical aspects of their employment. And as Gregor said, most of us, or all of us, came onto this project as 1Ls. Um, I yet have not taken ethics. Uh, so I will be doing that my third year of law school. Um, and so it is something that was really important for me to learn the practice of law, um, in addition to the actual um, you know, check boxes that we had to accomplish along the way, um, more of the meta framing of, of what is our ethical responsibility as a law student, as attorneys, um, as people who have engaged with a client to accomplish something. Um, this is a picture from this year's Congresso. Um, as you can see, um, I just want to highlight how important this project is or how well involved this project is at the school. Um, so this year we had about 30 students attend the Congresso, which is pretty impressive considering that the 1L class is 170. Um, so anywhere between, we're, we're training every year. Our trainings were attended by about 40 students or so. Um, so we could be training about a fifth of the class at any one time, um, which is pretty incredible when you think about it, that so many students are just being exposed to the trainings, let alone the opportunity to work with professionals. Um, and so this project and other projects like it are so important to make sure that the next generation of law students are being trained in these areas. Um, and so I wanted to point out um, the model pro bono policy, uh, which says that an attorney who acts as a mentor may earn two credits of general credit per completed matter in which he or she mentors a law student. And so this is a, a wonderful opportunity to do that. Okay, so um, I will close out just by again reiterating how thankful we are um, to the school for supporting us, to the attorneys who work with us, um, and especially to Professor Krakoff, um, who has been instrumental in making this happen. And so I will turn it back over to Gregor just for the last, this last part here, and then we'll go and have some great San Luis Valley beer. So, yeah, please. <laughs> so some of you might know uh, Professor Krakoff. Uh, Got a couple of trinkets from the university over the last year, and it was just such a delight to see her be a little embarrassed to receive them that we thought this would be the best venue to do it again. So, uh, you know, when we talk about volunteers and Professor Krakoff puts in the hours to put all this together, she deals with supervising attorneys, which I don't want to do. She deals with me, which my wife doesn't want to do. Um, and really, she exemplifies the spirit of volunteerism and. We wanted to show that on behalf of all the students, a, f a fifth of each class which gets trained by the Asakia Project with uh, this quite nice hand-colored Harper's Weekly from 1886 uh, entitled Irrigation on the Colorado uh, with a little card that says, Viva la Asakia! Thank you for your hard work, dedication, and inspiration. We'll carry your spirit of service forward in our hearts. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Krakoff. Um, thank you all, and I'll just say um, that was really unexpected, um, and Gregor did get to see me blush, which I know he enjoys, um, and this is why I'm really glad he's graduating this year. <laughs> Uh, no, but thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and you can see why I hang in there. It's because of these amazing students um, and all the ones that aren't here, and also the supervising attorneys. Um, so let's let's go eat. Yeah.